Hey guys, it's Casey. First off, I'd like to apologize for the massive lull in videos. Um, I was having a rough patch in my mental health. Turns out I got depression, but that's okay. We're back. We're making videos now. January to April 2019 wrap up. Guess I'm doing this uh, quarterly now, so okay. All right, anyways, so first off, trying a new format as well, as you can see. We got Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin. It is a fantasy slash drama for adults. So under the audience, we have the basic summary. Um, and let me say though, the summary for this does not nearly cover everything that happens in this book. That's just a very, very basic summary because this book is over 800 pages long. It is extremely complicated. The warnings I'm not gonna read, but um, I have that in case you have specific things you don't want to read about. The objectively best character so far is Tyrion because he's just the best, okay? Okay, so I'm still doing the five star thing, but now I'm going to try to make a little bit more of a list so that you can see better visually what I'm saying instead of me just chopping myself up. Whoa, wait, what? Ch <laughs> chopping up the footage of myself so much to the point that I'm not even saying any coherent sentences. So here we go. So the good things, the characterization was really good. I would say there are almost too many characters, but if you write it down, you'll be fine. So I'd say like in the first, say 100 pages, there's probably like 50 names you have to remember. But that being said, the characters are very fleshed out. This book also switches points of view, though it's always in the third person. Every single POV character matters and is interesting, important, and likable. Like, I definitely look forward to certain chapters more than others. Like I said before, Tyrion is my favorite character so far. But that being said, there's no character point of view that I just dread getting to, if that makes sense. The other thing that's really good about his characterization is very fast introduction scenes. And if you've been on my channel for a while, you've heard me talk about this before in my Attack on Titan review. But um, what I mean by like very fast characterization is that within a very short time after meeting the character, we get a working picture of what that character is like and how he or she is different from the rest of the characters. The way that he does it, he does that show don't tell thing you're supposed to do with characterization where he displays the personality through action and dialogue. Then the other thing, fleshed out plots and plot twists. This is by far the most complicated plot I've ever read in a book. You see that certain characters are quote unquote good people while others are not. And while the overall plot is about a power struggle, you also want to see the quote unquote good people win the throne. And then the pro style. I heard a lot of mixed reviews about the pro style. I think it's great. I can see why people might think it drags on, especially if you're a slower reader. And I don't mean that as a bad thing, because I think it's in many cases good to read slowly, but I could see how like certain descriptions and things like that could feel like they would drag on if you're a slower reader. I happen to be a too fast reader, so to me this pro style is perfect because it does slow me down a lot when there's description and things like that. On the other hand, like looking closer at the description, I don't think it's a necessary description. He uses description of setting to add to characterization because I think something he really understands is that we don't care about the setting that much, so by connecting it to the characters, he makes sure that all the description is relevant. Okay, so things I didn't like so much. The only thing that I thought was a little iffy was um, I didn't enjoy the abundance of rape. I mean, I think it could be realistic, but it also didn't have to be featured so prominently, if that makes sense. Then the other thing is the relationship between Daenerys and Drogo. And the only reason that's questionable to me is that she's so young. I mean, at the time, I suppose it wasn't that weird for like a 13 year old to marry someone who's much older than her. And then once she starts getting more ingrained in their society and everything, their relationship is not bad. Like I actually think they have a mutually respectful relationship eventually. But like at first when it's described of like the beginning of Daenerys and Drogo's marriage, like not the very first night where they consummated their marriage, I was actually very surprised, pleasantly surprised that Drogo asked for consent. But then after that, he seems to think that that consent extends to whenever he just feels like having sex with her. And I mean, marital rape is a thing and is a problem, but they kind of just brush over that. But yeah, overall, I really enjoyed the book. I would definitely give it a five out of five. Continuing. So the next book I read was Golden Sun by Pierce Brown. It's a sci-fi for adults. So it's a sequel to Red Rising. Society has been separated into a hierarchy based on color labels. Darrow, a man from the lowest stratum, the Reds, learns that his entire life mining on Mars has been based on lies from the upper classes. He sets out to change society by infiltrating the highest stratum, which is the Golds. So I have pretty high hopes for this book, considering I really enjoyed the first one.
Here's what I really liked about it. The plot twists in this were really well done. Did not see them coming, but looking back on it makes sense. And I don't want to spoil it, but if you read the book, you definitely know which major plot twist I'm talking about. Then the other thing is the pro style. I especially like Brown's usage of short, punchy, sometimes even one word fragments to describe intensely emotional parts, especially parts that are supposed to be exciting or action scenes, I think that's really effective. And the other thing, character flaws. So Darrow grew a lot in the first book character development wise, so I was a little worried he would stagnate. However, in Golden Sun, I think it's really well done that Darrow still has a lot of room to grow, especially regarding his relationship with Tactus. The other thing is that Darrow's flaws directly cause a lot of his problems. The other thing I liked was the romance. There was a breakup over the time skip which is one of my favorite romance tropes, by the way. But anyways, I just thought it was really well done because they have legitimate conflict and it's not just about, oh, he said, she said, misunderstanding, you know? Like it's actual idealistic conflict, not idealistic, ideological conflict. Um, then we got the cliffhanger. So yeah, those are the things that I thought were really well done. Then the things that I wasn't so pleased about, um, I didn't have many complaints about it, mostly just Cassius. The reason is that I was kind of looking forward to seeing Cassius a little bit more. Cassius kind of became a two-dimensional character in this book, and I assume he'll have more like screen time and everything in the future books, but I just wanted that sooner. Overall, I think the book was really good, so I give it five stars. Okay, the next one I finished is called Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. It's a historical fiction for adults, and it's the story of a Korean family across four generations after immigrating to Japan from about 1910 to about 1980. The things that I liked about it, the pro style. This book kind of surprised me because it had a lot of just narration or telling, which is usually frowned upon but really works here for some reason and I don't really know why. It's just a really readable style. And the other thing is character. I think there's some really fleshed out, well-written characters in this book that you can really get behind, but they're also not perfect. They have a lot of flaws, make really bad decisions, but you still don't hate anyone in this book. Then we got point of view. This switches points of view and I thought it did really well. That being said, I was also very pleased to find a book by a Korean author that I really liked because, well, I'll get to that in a bit, but yeah, um, there wasn't anything I particularly disliked about it, so, I mean, I'm not saying it's the perfect book, because is that really a thing, but, you know, there wasn't anything that bothered me about it, so, five stars for sure. All right, next we got Brightly Burning by Alexa Dunn, which is a romance slash sci-fi for young adults, and it is a Jane Eyre retelling in space, starring the governess slash engineer Stella Ainsley. This book I had heard of because I watch Alexa Dunn's YouTube channel. So I have been watching her channel for a while and I would definitely call myself a fan of her channel. So if you haven't seen her videos, you should definitely check it out. But um, that being said, I'm always kind of afraid to check out the writing of author tubers that I really like because often I end up not actually liking their work, which is ironic. I mean, I think it's totally compatible to like their YouTube channel and think they give good advice, but also not like their writing. But that's a debate for another day. The point is that I actually did end up liking it, which was a pleasant surprise because I knew I should factor in like, oh, I don't really like romance usually. I usually think it's freaking annoying, especially YA romance. I also read Jane Eyre and don't really like it that much either. So I was like, okay, this is just a recipe for disaster. So if I actually enjoy it, it's gonna be a big surprise. But what I was actually like afraid of is not so much that I wouldn't like it, I guess. It was more like I would think the writing is bad or just not that good. Um, not necessarily bad. I, I mean, I think there's definitely a spectrum, but like I would just think the writing was, eh, you know, could use some work kind of writing. But, you know, I didn't. I ended up reading it and I actually enjoyed it, which is crazy because this is not my genre. So the things that I liked were the characters. One of the reasons I just stopped reading YA because I think there's a lot of double standards and, you know, people will argue like, oh, you know, like people are fine with male characters who are overpowered, but when a female character is overpowered, you know, that's when everyone gets hissy. I mean, I think that's true to a degree, but I also don't like overpowered male protagonists. So like, you can't accuse me specifically of that issue. Like, it's not that I stopped reading YA with female protagonists, I just stopped reading YA. That being said though, I really can't think of that much YA with male protagonists for some reason, but whatever the case, Stella is likable. Like, she's genuinely likable, and that was a big surprise to me, because I think Jane is actually pretty annoying, like, in the original one. That being said, though, I hate Rochester, okay? Like, from the original Jane Eyre, I hate him so much. Like, you know, if I could punch one love interest from any work in the face, it would be Rochester. So, I do not like him at all. But, Hugo, Hugo is good. I like Hugo. He's likable, he's enigmatic, but he's also charismatic, 
which is something that Rochester didn't have. Like, I don't think Rochester's charismatic. I think he's annoying. I mean, I think in the book, he's not supposed to be charismatic, but female readers are supposed to like him. Or at least that's what happened when we read it in high school. Half my class was infatuated with him and I was just there like, oh my god, I hate this guy. But that's beside the point. Hugo makes logical decisions that a regular human being might do, not like locking your mentally ill wife in the attic for years. You know, that's not a thing that a normal, like, that's not a justifiable action. But Hugo, his decisions make sense. It, they're forgivable actions. Whereas Rochester, eh. The other thing is thank you, Alexa Dunn, for getting rid of the nasty age gap, okay? Then the other thing is she did some pretty good twists on the original storyline, especially with addition of Hanada, because a big problem with retellings is that they're really predictable because they're just exactly what happened in the original. So I think it was important to put a twist on it and I think it was well done. Also, another thing she did that was nice is diversity, but it was casual. While the main characters, I think, were probably supposed to be, like, whitish, she had a lot of, like, diverse names, but she didn't address the diversity on purpose. Like, she wasn't like, oh, look, Zhao is a Ching Chong Chinese lady. Like, thank you for not putting that in there because <laughs> you'd be surprised. Or the only thing I didn't really like was the theme aspect of Jane Eyre because that was the only thing that I could really say I liked about Jane Eyre was the themes or, like, especially regarding the fire symbolism with Bertha and Rochester. I mean, I could I could go on about that like for a long time, but I just won't. And we'll, we'll just say that that part was subtracted from this brightly burning retelling. You know, I don't think that's a huge deal. I'm just really surprised I liked it. So I wouldn't say it's just so freaking great, nor would I necessarily recommend this to other people, but I do think it was a good, a generally good book. So I'll give it about four stars. El próximo libro que terminé fue El Niño con el Pijama de Rayas, de John Boyne. Es una ficción histórica que tiene lugar en los años 40 durante la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Uh, básicamente, el libro es sobre la familia de Bruno, un niño de nueve años. Se muda a Auschwitz porque su padre es un oficial militar para los nazis. Bruno y un niño en el otro lado de la alambrada del campo se hacen amigos. Me encanta el libro. El libro es bastante triste. El punto de vista es de Bruno, un niño que tiene solamente nueve años, y el autor escribió el punto de vista muy bien. Es muy realista. Él no entiende nada que un niño no entendería sobre la guerra, el campo y los nazis. Bruno solo entiende la amistad humana que todos los adultos olvidan. Yo tengo solo un reclamo. El libro no es para jóvenes, en mi opinión. Adultos beneficiaría más que los jóvenes si leen este libro. Muchas personas me dijeron que leyeron el libro en el sexto grado, pero si yo necesitaba leer este libro en el sexto grado, hubiera sido una experiencia un poco traumática porque no es un libro feliz. Todavía me lo encanta, pero es maduro por niños, en mi opinión. Todavía le doy cinco estrellas. The next book I tried to finish but did not was The Court Dancer by Kyung Suk Shin, which is a historical fiction for adults. I don't know what it's about because I didn't get that far. Um, and don't know the warnings because again, did not get that far. But <laughs> basically, I tried to read like the first chapter and it just really put me off. Because first of all, I didn't like the prose. Obviously, the author is Korean, but as I was reading it, I could kind of tell it was written in Korean before it was written in English. Like, I didn't realize it was translated when I first picked it up, and I just started reading it, and I was like, this feels translated, checked, and it was indeed translated. I just don't think it was translated very well, because a lot of the flow that was probably there in the Korean was lost. Um, it was just kind of awkward in a lot of places, like, there was some very awkward phrasing, and it also put me off that they sort of just drop you in the middle of this, like, weird sex scene right in the beginning, which wasn't really my thing. I mean, I don't mind sex scenes, but I just think it's kind of weird to do that first. Like, before we know anything else about the characters, that might make us interested. That combination of factors, I was just like, eh, not worth finishing this book. I don't like it. I know that seems kind of harsh to some people, probably, that I dropped it without even finishing the first chapter, but, like, I can, I can talk about that if you want me to and, like, why I do that, but I'm not gonna give it a star rating because I didn't finish it, so yeah. La primera novela gráfica que terminé fue Doble Sentido, de Nicholas, Nicholas Asker. 
Es una ficción realista por adultos sobre dos personajes que están contemplando sus relaciones románticas con una mujer. Originalmente pensé que el título en inglés es Double Meaning, pero cuando busqué en la red descubrí que el título en inglés es Second Thoughts. Pero me gusta Double Meaning más que Second Thoughts. No sé about you, but anyways. Generalmente me gustaba el libro, pero los personajes eran un poco genéricos, no me importa mucho. La historia no era mucha aburrida ni mucha interesante. Sin embargo, me gusta el estilo de arte. A veces tenía un fondo negro con dibujos blancos y por eso los dibujos destacan más. En definitiva, el libro era medio para mí. Le doy tres estrellas. Pero es posible que yo no entendía lo que estaba pasando en el libro porque mis habilidades de español necesitan trabajo. Next graphic novel, manga, this is a manga, was Goodnight Poon Poon Volume 2 by Inio Asano. And it is a realistic fiction slash Bildung's Roman, which means coming of age story for adults. Volume 1, I talked about in a previous wrap up. Don't remember what I said about it, but the point is that I enjoyed it. So Poon Poon is in middle school now, feuding with a classmate over the love of his life. And meanwhile, Yuichi, Uncle Yuichi, is reflecting and contemplating the meaning of his life and struggling to move on from his past. And uh, this one actually made me like Yuichi more. I mean, I think he was always presented as a character with a lot of potential, um, particularly with the way he behaves in volume one. So the things I liked is that this is a really great sequel. We kind of get the idea with Poon Poon and his struggles in volume one, but now we get to see Yuichi after his problems were sort of foreshadowed in the previous volume. The other thing is the nuance that the story is told with, because I think these characters are a lot of the times like what you would call terrible people because they do terrible things, but they're not necessarily portrayed as one dimensional bad guys. I, in fact, I wouldn't say that at all. Then the other thing I like about Inio Asano is he has very strange artistic decisions like definitely merits more videos if you guys would want to see anything like studying the art of goodnight poo poo not that i'm an artist but you know i try and the other thing is the feels man lots of feels okay um the only thing that bothered me a little bit is that yuichi says a lot in this volume that he's too old for somebody but we actually can't tell because that's him on the cover so you can't really tell how old he's supposed to be he's not a bird he's a human he's just represented this way for some reason regardless that's fine um that didn't bother me that much so five stars All right, then Attack on Titan volumes 23 to 28 by Hajime Isayama. It's a fantasy slash sci-fi, and I'd say the audience is new adult or adult. So this is a basic summary. Humanity is trapped inside a circular wall surrounded by man eating humanoid monsters called Titans. Aaron and his friends seek to free humanity from its quote unquote cage. Um, so that's sort of like the beginning, but at this point in the manga, it's the situation has changed dramatically. The objectively best character is still Jean because even though I hate his freaking neck beard, he's still good, you know? Things I like are the character flaws. Like this makes me kind of think back to the beginning of the manga or slash anime. And I'm wondering like, did he start this whole thing the wrong way? Because I think a lot of people who started watching the anime weren't expecting it to go in this direction. And it's almost like a different genre than what he had originally said it was or made it seem like. But that being said, a lot of people think Aaron sucks. I mean, I think you can kind of agree that he's not the best person on their planet or anything. But um, I just think the character flaws are done really well. Like, you kind of just don't like anybody in this manga. But you also don't hate anybody, if that makes sense. I mean, maybe you do, but like, I don't think any of them are is like objectively hateable, if that makes sense. Like, I guess that doesn't make sense because hate is a sort of a subjective thing. But I don't think anyone is like straight up just the worst person ever. You know what I'm saying? Then the other thing is the shock value. I think Isayama, one of the things he does is he uses surprise and shock very well. And if you read the most recent chapter, you know what I'm talking about. Then theme emphasis and evolution. I think uh, I probably want to do a separate video on this, so I won't talk about it too much. But the point is, it's just crazy, dude. Then again, the ambiguity part, and what I mean by that is that, again, none of the characters are like super terrible, like you just obviously should hate them or anything like that. And then of course, the feels, because this manga has a lot of feels in it. The things that I didn't like were the bit, like I feel like Gabby was handled a bit heavy handedly. Her whole, oh, Eldians, we're the good Eldians, they're the bad Eldians. Like I understand that she's supposed to be like a child, can't tell how old she's supposed to be. I put her at like 12 to 14 or something like that. You know, just because his drawings are, it's a little bit hard to tell how old everyone's supposed to be. No offense, That's, I think everyone would agree on that. But um, I just thought that was a little bit too outright stated, if that makes sense. And then the other thing is Isayama's 
has the same problem he's been having since the beginning of very rough transitions between arcs. Overall, I enjoyed it, so I th- I'd give it four stars. All right, next we got My Hero Academia, volumes 21 to 22, by Kohei Horikoshi. This is a fantasy slash balloons roman for young adults. Basic summary, uh, in a world where superpowers called quirks are the norm, quirkless high school student Midoriya aims to become a professional superhero. The things that I liked about these two volumes were Endeavor's character development. I think that was well done. Sue me, actually don't. But, uh, you know, if you want to see why I think that, you can check out the video I made on it a while back when everyone was complaining about it. I'll link that in the description if you'd like to see that. For volume 22, though, oh, we finally saw Todoroki do something creative with his quirk. Like, I do think Todoroki is OP. And if you want to talk to me about that, tell me to make a video about it because that would just be quicker because I'm sure there are plenty of people who are like, nah, but whatever. The point is, one of Todoroki's major weaknesses, I think, is that we never see him do anything creative with his quirk. He shoots fire, he shoots ice, that's it, right? Whereas a character like Bakugo, for instance, uses his quirk in very creative ways, right? He does little explosions, he has grenades that make big explosions, he does specific explosions with his howitzer thingy, he can fly around with it, you know. His quirk is less powerful objectively, but he makes it really dangerous with his creativity, whereas Todoroki has a objectively way more dangerous quirk, but he's not creative because he's so- why why would he need to be, I guess, because he's just that much more powerful than most people. So, I like that they finally have Todoroki doing something creative with his quirk. Uh, However, there were more complaints about this, so let me just say that in order to talk about the things I don't like, I do need to spoil a little bit. Um, I'll try to spoil as little as possible, but there may still be what you- or you might consider them spoilers still, so I'll put a timestamp if you want to skip that. But basically, Divided Focus, Deku's Quirk, Shinso. Okay. So first is the Divided Focus, and I know that Horikoshi has a huge cast, and uh, I'll give him that. However, I don't see the purpose of giving them attention, especially the Class B kids, because I don't care that Monoma feels like he'll never be in the spotlight. Like, I want him to just be funny. Like, that's all I want him for. I don't care about his personal struggles or anything like that. I'd rather have him advance the story than see Monoma's backstory. Wasn't even his backstory, Monoma's insecurities playing out there. Then Deku's quirk. I think that is a terrible idea. The whole bazillion quirks thing, and I think uh, he's falling into the classic Naruto trap where your bad guy is so OP or your good guy is so OP that you need to make their counterpart more OP to compensate. All for one is too powerful. Solution? Give Deku 50 quirks. No, no, please no. I think that's what's happening here. I just, I just think it's a bad idea. I mean, I'm willing to see, like, I'm not gonna drop it, like, drop the series. I'm willing to see how he handles it. But just from, like, what I've read so far, I I think it's a terrible idea. Shinso. I just don't like him. Like, it's not that it was poor writing, I don't think, or anything like that. I just think Shinso's annoying. You know why, though? I have a lot of online friends who are also into My Hero, and I'm trying to talk to them about it, but all they want to talk about is Shinso, who at the time had only appeared, like, in the sports festival, and then that was it. And all they want to talk about is how hot Shinso is. And I'm just like, ugh, so I'm just tired of him. It's not like something that I think is objectively bad about the manga or anything. I just, I just don't like him that much. So, you know, volume 21 was stronger than volume 22, but um, if you average them together, I think you get about three stars. So that's what I put there. All right, now we're getting into webtoons. So I had heard about webtoons and I heard that it was the next big thing or whatever. So I said, all right, let, let me try. And um, I had had previous experiences, poor experiences with webtoons on Tumblr. But uh, you know what they say, be careful about uh, the stuff you see on Tumblr. So so this webtoon is called True Beauty by Yangi. Not sure to pronounce that. It is a romance slash realistic fiction for young adults. It's about Ju Young, a high school student who changes her appearance using makeup and no one recognizes her as the frumpy girl from middle school. She attracts the attention of several cute and mysterious boys. Oh, also in the warnings, I forgot to put it there, but there should also be suicide there. Overall, I was very surprised because I actually enjoy this. I mean, it's not finished yet, so I'm not giving it a star rating, but so far, I think it's a really interesting concept and the characters are really interesting and it's very subtle, surprisingly. When you see something called true beauty, you think it's not gonna be subtle at all, but uh, it's actually very subtle. The only complaint I have about it is that too many names start with S, like uh, both of the guys she meets start with S and then there's another character. There's Suo, Sojan, and Seon. It's not like a huge deal, it's just kind of annoying. The other webcomic that I tried is Seed underscore, I guess it's just called Seed, I don't really know how to pronounce the title, by Said P. It's a sci-fi for young adults. Emma, a high school student, accidentally befriends a rogue AI with mysterious intentions. This is also not finished yet, so I'm not gonna give it a star rating, 
but the things that I really like about it are the dialogue. I think the dialogue is very natural, which is really important for a comic. Realistic friendships. A lot of people don't really know how to write high school friendships. Usually they're just not meme-tastic enough, you know what I'm saying? So I think that Seed does a really good job realistically portraying teenagers. Then there's the balance of science jargon with layman's language. So even though I don't really know the exact science terminology that they're using, I still understand what's going on in the story more or less, so that's really well done. And there's nothing in particular I don't like about it, but yeah, again, no star warning, star warning, star rating because it's not done yet. Then Mob Psycho 100 by One and Studio Bones is a fantasy slash buildings roman for young adults. Basically, a middle school student with ESP mob stops other espers from misusing their psychic abilities. So this was season two. I was really pleasantly surprised by season two because everything I liked about season one, they kept it there, but still managed to add more to make it even better. So the characters were more fleshed out, they dived into the characters more, especially Reagan. Because I think season one was more about Mob and Ritsu. It's still really funny. I think I want to do some th videos on the theme, so I'm not going to talk about them too much, but I just really like how they handle them. Then the balance between humor, serious moments, past and present. I just think Mob Psycho has a really great balance. I always call it Mob Psycho instead of Mob Psycho 100. I don't know why I do that, but Mob Psycho 100, sorry. The only thing I didn't like was that I thought the final battle between Toichiro and Mob was too short. Give it five stars. Okay, this thing. The Promised Neverland is a fantasy horror anime for new adults or adults. Orphans Emma, Ray, and Norman learn that their happy orphanage is actually a farm for harvesting young brains to feed to the demons that seem to rule the outside world. They plot to escape the farm where their beloved mama is their warden. This show was amazing. Like, first of all, the suspense. Character, I think, was also really well done. Particularly the villains. Like, I think Isabella is probably my new favorite villain just in general. They spend most of the first episodes like just demonizing her and then you get the first glimpse of oh my god like she was one of them when she offers Emma the chance to become one of the mamas and then that's just perfect foreshadowing for the final episode which actually oh made me so the feels dude. This is this is just such a solid show I would highly recommend. So five out of five stars. Sword of the Stranger by Studio Bones. It's a historical fantasy for new adult slash adult. A young boy, Kotaro, is being hunted by the Chinese military for unknown reasons, and a rogue samurai decides to help him. The stranger being the rogue samurai. Um, I thought this was a pretty solid movie, especially for a standalone. I think it was pretty good. Um, I like the dialogue, and I did watch it subtitled, so I'm not sure exactly how well it flowed, but I did like that old lines of dialogue would come back in a new context that gives it extra weight, if that makes sense. I think the feels are really strong. I think this is just a very emotionally compelling storyline in general. But the thing I didn't like was the language switching, um, because this takes place in Japan with Chinese soldiers in it. So sometimes they would have the Chinese soldiers speak Chinese to like signify how they don't speak the same language and then the Japanese people don't understand what they're saying. But then other times when they want the audience to understand what the Chinese soldiers are saying, they just have the Chinese soldiers speak in Japanese. And I think that that was very distracting for me. And I don't even speak either of those languages, but I can tell the difference when I hear it. I would have just went with one or the other, like just have them speak in Japanese all the time and pretend like they don't understand or just have them speak Chinese the entire time. But whatever, that, that just annoyed me. And the other thing that I didn't like is that they didn't, they never tell you why they need Kotaro to complete this like immortality ceremony or whatever, which is a huge like problem for me, which is probably what knocked it down to four stars instead of five. But yeah, I just forgot to write it there for some reason because I'm great. Sorry guys. Um, the other thing, One Punch Man. Okay, this is season one. By one, Madhouse. It's a fantasy for young adults. Saitama is a hero who has become so strong that he can defeat any villain with a single punch. He seeks a strong opponent and also takes on a pupil, the dedicated cyborg Genos. Though Moomin Rider's the best character, just, just saying. He looks so cute, I don't know why. Anyways, I think the humor was really good. It was funny. And then the other thing that I liked is the subversion of usual shonen themes. It has a really fresh feeling about it because I think other shonens tend to focus a lot on strength, competitiveness, you know, becoming stronger through hard work. And then you just have Saitama here who's like not really trying to do anything. He just became a hero because he thought it'd be fun. He doesn't want to, you know, help people or be the greater good or whatever. He just, he's like, yeah, that'd be fun. He's just like an unemployed guy. Really fresh, you know? So I give it four stars. This was a rewatch of Legion of Superheroes by Warner Bros. Animation. <laughs> I'm dead. Oh god, this is a sci-fi fantasy for children. A teenage Superman is recruited by the Legion of Superheroes, a group of young heroes from the 31st century, in order to help them fight crime across the galaxy. Um, and the best character is not Cosmic Boy. 
<laughs> okay, so this show just cracks me up. They look terrible, okay? Oh my god, the anatomy, the anat- I've never seen anatomy this screwed up that I didn't notice at the time that I watched it. So I was I was a kid when I first watched this and uh, I decided to rewatch it just for fun. I mean, I think it's a pretty solid kid show actually. Um, I was wondering like what I would think of it now, but it, it's pretty solid, I think. It, it has snappy dialogue and the dialogue is pretty good. While unnatural at times, it's not like terribly unnatural, especially for a kid show where they're trying to kind of state things explicitly so that little kids can understand better what's going on. I think characterization is pretty good because that's one of the things that they don't just say explicitly all the time. I know when I was a kid, I didn't have a clear picture of who the characters really were and what their personalities were like, but rewatching it, it's so obvious. So I just think they did a really great job with character. And then the balance of humor and seriousness is very good. This show is actually really funny. I don't remember it being funny, but it's freaking hilarious. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's a solid show, man. Um, the other thing I thought was really funny is the first time I watched it, I remember not liking Cosmic Boy, but I couldn't figure out why. But rewatching it, I realized it's because he's an arrogant asshole, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. It's just, it's also just like hugely nostalgic to go back and watch an old cartoon that you used to like when you were a kid. Anyways, the things I didn't like the art. <laughs> Being a little bit more attentive to that now than I was then, it's very painful to look at sometimes. Because not only like do the characters and the designs themselves just look kind of weird, they're also very inconsistent. Like they just randomly start looking weird out of nowhere. The other thing is gender equality. The female characters have barely any personality compared to their male counterparts. Saturn Girl has been there in season one and season two. She never got her own episode. Most of the other characters or the male characters have all gotten their own episode. Not all, I shouldn't say that, but like in this picture here, we got Superman, Lightning Lad, Brainiac 5, Timberwolf, and Bouncing Boy. All of them have at least had at least one episode just dedicated to them. Whereas Phantom Girl and Saturn Girl have never had an episode about them. Like they've been major players in episodes, but they didn't get their own. You know? And then the convenience aspect. So I think one of the problems that a lot of shows run into when they have like teams of superheroes is that they should be able to accomplish way more than they actually do or they're like significantly underpowered when they're together but then when they're separate they use all of their abilities. There's just a few too many instances where it's just like really dude why are you just standing there in the background come on but uh, other than that like that's okay you know it would be too complicated so I give it five stars. Also for the nostalgia factor that also influenced my decision. <laughs> this, is, this is a pretty solid show okay. All right, then the, now we're in the did not finish section. So first we got Dororo by Osamu Tezuka, I'm not sure to pronounce that, and Twin Engine is a fantasy for a new adult maybe, I don't know. Hyakimaru's father made a deal with demons to exchange his son's body parts for prosperity in the land, and the demons seem to have obliged him at first, but 16 years later, things are beginning to fall apart and Hyakimaru is killing dragons, dragons? Sorry, killing demons to regain his lost body parts. All right. Like, I think I got like 12, 13 episodes into this. And the reason is that I was also watching Mob Psycho and The Promised Neverland and I just wanted something else to be watching. But uh, once those two other shows stopped, I didn't, I no longer felt an urge to watch that show. Um, I think I just wanted to, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know what I was doing. But the point is, I think I knew from the start, I wasn't super into it, but it's all right. It was really just mediocre for me. The other one is Violet Evergarden. Kana Katsuki and Akiko Takase and Kyoto Animation. This was very disappointing for me because everyone said this show was so freaking good. Like everyone was telling me to watch this and I was like, oh my gosh, okay, yes, this looks cool. This looks cool. I didn't like it. Okay, I usually watch one episode before I decide to drop something. Sometimes I'll drop something after the first five minutes. Like I'm very picky, but because I heard so many good things about this, even after not liking the first episode, I tried the second episode. So I watched two whole episodes of this and couldn't get into it. And I really wanted to too. So I was a little bit sad because everyone said it was so good and they got so many feels. And I don't know, I just don't, just having a disconnect, man. Basically, I think my major issue was I thought it was gonna be more action oriented because of the setup that she was some kind of soldier or something like that, but it seems to be more of a drama. And the other thing is, I just feel like I've seen this done a million times, just not as well animated. Cause like, I will give it that it looks really good. However, Violet is boring. Like, I don't understand why everyone's so attached to her. Like, I get that she's a cute girl or whatever with a, you know, cute little voice and stuff, but 
I just don't find her compelling. Like, I think even Brainiac 5 from the Legion of Superheroes cartoon was more interesting than her. Like, we get the robot-like character trying to become human. Because I think humans, we're a little obsessed with ourselves. We think that the best state of being is to be a human. So, you know, we have all these stories about AIs, robots, you know, whatever, trying to be as human as they can, understand love. You know, what is love? I want to understand it. I want to be a part of human society like a normal person, you know, yada yada. And then we have Violet, who kind of seems to have that same goal, but is just not interesting. Like, she doesn't have any personality or anything. It wasn't amazing, you know? And I I was kind of expecting something amazing. So I'm probably not going to finish it, unless you guys are really, like, sure that I'll like it as it goes on. But, like, based on the first two episodes, probably not going to enjoy it. I don't know. Yeah, so uh, that's it for my January to April wrap-up. This is the longest freaking video ever. I'm sorry about that. So I think I'll probably go back to try monthly after this. I was just in, in a little bit of a mental health hole, so that's why I wasn't- or I didn't get this done on time in March. But yeah, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for sticking around, even though I haven't been posting lately. But yeah, I think we're back in the groove now. So, oh yeah, and don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of any of these books, webtoons, anime. Because I'm always curious what you guys are thinking, especially tell me who your favorite characters are. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in another video. Bye!